couple of weeks ago, Christina Liu, a Philadelphian teen, witnessed a young Asian boy being attacked. She immediately stepped in, redirecting the aggression toward herself and sustaining a wide array of injuries at the hands of fellow teenagers. For our very first podcast, we invited Christina herself to discuss this specific instance of Asian hate and the general and overarching impacts of racism against Asian people, something that we as an organization are very passionate about as we are dedicated to spreading awareness and annihilating hate, so to speak. So we're going to start off this podcast with kind of an interview portion with um, overarching questions and specific questions about what you personally experienced, because I feel like a lot of other people that have experienced hate on some kind of other level can either relate to this or have a shared understanding of what happened to you. So um, first, when you witnessed the boy being attacked, you had to make a very difficult decision very quickly. What was your thought process in the moments leading up to that attack? Um, so in the process, I really didn't think of the consequences of what would happen to me. I just like saw the boys be getting hurt and I, um, I couldn't stand seeing that, so I stepped in. Yeah, it was almost instinctual, right? Like fight or flight, heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. And I like, I feel like a lot of people maybe whose stories aren't widely publicized have had to make a difficult decision similar to this. And so how do you feel about like the injustice that's faced by because obviously nobody should have to make this kind of difficult decision. So how do you feel about the fact that other people I'm sure have had to like sustain injuries in order to save somebody else from hate. Um, I think that's like really brave of them. And I, um, it's like really like, I guess in that heat of the moment, like you said, it's like a flight or um, fight situation. And I think it's like really powerful that they are able to stand up to that. But there are also like situations where um, like these like um, situations aren't publicized. And I still do believe that we should um, be thankful for the ones that aren't, but like, I feel like we need to make them publicized to show like, um, Important. Yeah, and there's other instances. I feel like there's a phenomenon with like big, sometimes even tragic events where when they're publicized, it can sometimes lead to a proliferation of other things. I read an article about this instance not happening with hate, um, hate crimes or attacks, but rather with suicides. For example, in a school or school district, if a child like takes their own life and that is widely known about, widely publicized, then it could lead to somebody else taking very drastic actions and hurting themselves for that kind of, you know, for that kind of recognition. Do you think that this same phenomenon exists to a certain extent with like these Asian hate crimes or hate crimes as a whole? I think um, it does. And as like for um, hate crimes in general, it like um, pushes the racial divide, make, um, makes it, creates it like larger than it already is, um, make, forcing people to like um, like go against each other when it's actually not like uh, a whole race problem. It's just like the um, influence of others or like just the influences of society that causes people to think that way. Yeah, oh, that's a perfect segue to my next question. Um, <laughs> the media is using this story to hit different racial groups against each other, seeing as at least one of your attackers is Black. How do you feel about this, and how should people view this event instead, as you know, if you aren't one of the key witnesses? Um, so I think um, for uh, the, uh, I think um, what race they were or like like both parties, um, what race rate they were, it wasn't like a big um, importance. Um, I think uh, the importance was like, it was a hate crime. It was um, an aggression from a, per, um, a group of people attacking just um, defense, defenseless, um, just calm people at the train. And I think um, due to that, um, like how media portrays that, it caused like a lot of misunderstandings between um, like uh, the Black community, but also the Asian community. Um, so yeah. So, I have a follow-up question yeah. to that, if I can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how else do you think the media portray the event beneficially um, in that it uh, raises more awareness or how might it also create some misunderstandings? 
Um, so um, that video didn't really, I guess, showcase um, the whole story. Um, like, um, like after the video ended, there were people like my classmates um, covering me head to toe with their bodies to stop any more attacks. And like during the fight or like before the fight actually started, um, when I stood up, one of my um, friends um, saw that like the their their aggression was towards me now, and so she tried to pull me away, but I pushed her down, afraid that she might herself get um, attacked. And then um, I think uh, a part that's like um, beneficial is that it shows that there is a need of like um, that that there is a flaw in society and that we need to stand together to like change it yeah definitely and I feel like um like these videos and stuff like that um a lot of the stories that have been like a lot of the publications that have been using your story they attach the video from I believe it's the security footage from the train and a lot of the videos of hate crimes specifically that you see especially hate crimes that are widely publicized they're very gory right like so how do you feel about kind of the commodification of gore in activism um so so when uh, the video actually went up to, on Instagram, I actually couldn't stand actually like seeing it for myself, just because like um it's really gory, it's like really um just violence in general is like just mm -hmm. um, dangerous, um but like I guess like um in a way it is beneficial, but it can also cause PTSD or like just Definitely. causing trauma to the other people. Um, around and which was why I like wanted people like just to cover the situation when I was attacked or like just like cover the faces of the victims because that can also like because um, victims um, they prefer like privacy and like recovery. Yeah, I feel like um, that's kind of a trend, right? Like how they attach videos and a lot of publications. I feel like you offer an interesting perspective, right? Because a lot of us here are outsiders looking in. And I feel like to somebody in the situation, like that can definitely be really triggering, right? Yeah, um, like for me, when I like first saw it or my family first saw it, I I like um, just like felt like throwing up or like just like yeah. metaphorically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you feel like um, if you if you could give a message to media, um, how do you feel like they could raise awareness for the situation, um, while making the victims comfortable? Um, I think that covering or blurring out the faces of the victims, um, but also blurring out the attack and just like um, sh still showing the video, but in a way that it can like cover um the privacy of the victims. And show that like um, a a bigger picture like of what happened rather than that video, and definitely. Yeah, with like this heightened ability of like people just taking out their phones and recording situations, a lot of these people like don't really edit their videos. They just like <laughs> post it on social media, so everyone's faces are leaked. Not like just the victim, but also like the perpetrators, like bystanders. Everyone's faces are like just shoved into the media. And like with this heightened media, um, how do you think like people, how do you think this coverage has like increased or benefited, like has like, has it been beneficial or harmful for those who are suffering these hate crimes? Um, so I am in contact with um, the boys, but um, currently they are in school, back to school, um, and like they're just like trying to like make way, um, just like trying to go about their day. And I'm pretty sure there's no media coverage for them right now, which is good because I do know that they want a low profile. And like for me personally, um, I knew that like um, it would definitely be different for me just because like I stood up, it was a different situation rather than them. Um, at first um, I was like really nervous. I didn't know if I wanted to like speak up or not, but then like after talking to many people, I realized that it's my duty or like it's my 
I have to stand up and speak about like what happened, raise awareness. Yeah. yeah. It's a great thing you did. It, it really is. And I feel like this situation, um, I feel like a lot of times with like hate crimes and stuff like that, especially like racially motivated hate crimes, there's like this phenomenon of victim blaming, right? And especially if you're like in your situation, uh, people who are maybe more ignorant or didn't understand the choices that you were facing, um, like, have you experienced any kind of guilt about the situation? Because like you said, like, um, you, it wasn't like you and the boys, it was different situations, right? So have you experienced like any personal guilt or even like external victim blaming about it? Um, I haven't, I like, don't feel guilty about me stepping in at all. Yeah. But, um, for victim blaming, I think, in um, the boys' situation, they were like called cowards, like they didn't come to help, but like they were attacked too. Definitely. And like they were scared, to ju- they were kids. So I totally understood. Mm-hmm. And like, um, I think like also people stating that I should have fought back or the boys should have fought back. Um, in that situation, it's like fight or flight, or you're like, um, I couldn't even process that they even like hit me already. So it was like hard to even like realize that they did. Yeah. Yeah, you start, you're talking about how like you, you are, although you're a senior, the boys who were attacked were very young. Yeah, (laughs) the attackers are also very young. Um, So what do you think this says about like the wide reaching impacts of hate and racism? Is hate like, do you consider it to be taught or is it something that's just like, um, I think hate is embedded in our um, in our history. Um, it's hate crimes and like racism has always, it's like just um, always been in our history. And like I think in some some schools or like some just some environments, they are influenced to act this way. So I, in a way, yes, I do think that hate is taught. But I feel like it's more of an influence and like just like not no not proper um, like education to learn about um, people around you or like people with different cultures, et cetera. Do you think the education systems or parents can take steps towards preventing this kind of um, indoctrination of racism in children? Um, Yes, I definitely do. Um, For the education system, I feel like there should all, um, there should be like seminars or classes revolving around Asian Americans, but also African American history, Um, just like many of the different cultures. And for parents, I do um, hope that they can teach their kids to be open minded, like just explain their situation through a thought process, but also like uh, making sure to um, have um, other um, thought process that might be different from like what society views and yeah. Yeah, and then going back to what you said about like curriculum, teaching stuff in schools, like seminars and stuff like that. I understand that like with higher education, college and stuff like that, they definitely have more specific seminars, especially if you're going into something like gender studies, like racial studies, stuff like that. But how do you think that can be implemented into a high school level, especially with like critical race theory, right? Because a lot of uh, schools are talking about that. So what's your like stance on that? So currently I... um. In high school in Philadelphia, we do have an African American um, requirement, uh, African American history requirement, and like um, in United States currently, they are like um, pl- trying to implement um, Asian American history in um, schools um, fully. And there are some schools, uh, I, I mean, some states that have already implemented, and I hope that there will be so much more. And yeah, I think. No, I think it's, um, I think it's really nice that you have an African American history requirement. Um, Have you like taken one of the classes pertaining to that requirement yet? Um, Yes, uh, I took it in sophomore year. Oh, that's really cool. Okay, so what was your experience with that? Um, It made me um, learn much more about um, African American history, also their culture. Mm -hmm. And it also like made me um, look like a person from looking out from into within like yeah. and just like understanding like where they are from how um how did they grow up and yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So and, you and I go to the same school yeah. I don't think we 
have any of that in our curriculum? No. Um, in our school, we have this curriculum, which um, we discuss African-American history quite a bit in our history classes. However, for the Asian units, um, like a Japanese history, Chinese history, it's usually like a unit or two. So last year, there was like a unit, which was about two weeks coverage. Um, yeah. <laughs> How do you think so, so do you think teaching more about the history could help? Um, yes, I do think so. It just like lets people know how did they come to America? How did they um, just like um, transform? How did they like influence history now? And yeah. Yeah, and I feel like with immigration and stuff like that, some people right now, especially in the U.S., with all of the controversial stuff with immigration laws going on, they have pretty like binary views about immigration. Like either immigrants are like they because of the way that the laws are structured right now immigrants are viewed as like inherently bad inherently illegal inherently like like sneaky stealing jobs stuff like that and I feel like a lot of the history can really help like influence how like a modern day perspective and I think that that's really important and it's really unfortunate that schools don't have that um speaking about um immigration and government Mm -hmm. policies um how do you think reputation, sorry, representation in government could affect um, thoughts in public about um, Asian Americans? Or I think um, like representation in government with Asian Americans would be um, a great boost because it um, gives a broader perspective on situations like immigration, um, culture, and like what act- what the um, um, state or country needs as a society as a whole and yeah rep- representation I believe is much very important like women represent women representation but also ra- ra- race representation and yeah. yeah and I feel like there's a bunch of common misconceptions about representation because people automatically assume that the only way that representation can make a difference is like the implementation of laws or new legislature, which I think is um, kind of like a shallow viewpoint, right? Because sometimes representation and just seeing people, especially in like marginalized or minority groups in a place of power is really empowering, especially for young people, because they have this idea that somebody who is the same as them, somebody who is the same minority as them, like an Asian person, a woman, a Black person can have the same amount of power as somebody who has historically been like at the top of the like systems like racism and stuff like that which I think is really really important definitely yeah I think like it just like inspires the young generation to know that they're not like stuck in this just one box but they're able to flourish and yeah yeah like when we talk about the small, like the small box, um, often what comes to mind is like the model minority that many yeah. Asians have to follow. And the word Asian is just feels very broad in this sense because it encapsulates so many different kinds of people. Mm-hmm. And so how do you think, um, hold on, sorry, I just like lost myself in that moment. Um, so like, how do you think uh, as an Asian uh, community, how can we overcome the small box of like model minority archetype? How can like everyone currently correct their current existing biases and prejudice regarding Asian people? Um, I think um, the model minority myth is a myth like it is what it says. Um, but um, I think that by um, speaking up or like just standing up for what is right, they are able to um, break free from that small box and like help make a change and yeah. Definitely. And I think that Asian people uniquely struggle with like the model minority, especially with microaggressions, right? Like the other day, somebody like I've heard so many jokes where people are like, oh, like I'll get a bad grade on a test or something. And people will be like, well, they'll make a, a small dig at how I'm Asian and like I'm supposed to be smart. And those microaggressions often fly under the radar because like it's smart is considered a compliment. But when you attach it to something like your race, it's not really a compliment. It's a microaggression. And I feel like um, kind of breaking free of the model minority would make those existing microaggressions viewed as something that's not a compliment, but something that's actually bad. Yeah, definitely.
historically Asians aren't typically seen as people who take a stand for their rights. Yeah. It's definitely happened before, but it's not very common. So I think it would be super beneficial if we um, get representation and a stand up for ourselves. Yeah, as a senior heading to high school, Christina, have you ever faced like certain kinds of microaggression? Um, throughout my middle school, I think I did um, it was just like um, what Michi said. It was like more like, oh, you're Asian, you can get good grades, or you're really quiet. They like sometimes like push it with um, my race and yeah. And then I think that um, something that's really harmful, even um, like at a peer level, obviously microaggressions like that are super harmful and can ruin your image of yourself. But I think something that's also really harmful is microaggressions from somebody or prejudice against Asian people from somebody who's at an authority level. And I think that um, Joyce was telling me a while back, I think, she was talking about how uh, the Chinese teacher at her school, I mean, why don't you elaborate on this? Okay, well, Stephen <laughs> and I both don't take Chinese at our school, even though it's like a given class, we can both take Mandarin. And we both could like get into AP super easy, <laughs> easy credit, throw it away. But um, um, we both didn't pick Chinese. I don't know why Steven didn't pick Chinese. I personally didn't pick Chinese because I knew the Chinese teachers would fit me harshly, even though I barely speak fluent Mandarin and I can barely read or write. Well, I'm more illiterate. I can definitely speak fluently, but like because of what I look and because I am like Chinese, the Chinese teachers grade me harsh would grade me harsher. Than, yeah. Yeah. And also because of physical features, some people have assumed that I'm Korean or Japanese mm -hmm. in certain these forms of, um, I don't think they intend to offend, or this might not be even considered as microaggression, maybe just ignorance on the part of um, considering. No, it's honestly super weird because sometimes people, um, it's almost like, I don't want to trivialize this by calling it this, but it's almost like a game to people. They'll try to guess your ethnicity based on your name or your last name or how you look. And it's kind of demeaning because they reduce you to, to like this trivia for them, this game. Like my name is Michi, but it's not my given name. It comes from my, my first and middle name, which is Melinda and Chelsea. And, um, people assume that because my name like Michi those kinds of sounds are pretty prevalent in like Japanese and stuff like that they automatically assume that I'm Japanese and then I think one time I was talking to somebody and they they were like they were talking about something Japanese and they said oh Michi you would know about this and I I of course was like oh no like common misconception not Japanese and then they <laughs> proceeded to say but you love sushi <laughs> And I don't, I don't really, I don't really know how those are correlated, but I just think it's, uh, it's not really funny, but at this point, I feel like we have to make it funny. Um, people, it's, I think, is this something that's unique to Asian people? I don't really think it is, but a lot of people will just try to put you in this box, this category based on your name, based on your looks. And it's something that shouldn't really be happening. Um. Adding on to that too, um, I have a question for Christina uh, based on anecdotal um, experiences. Um, have you ever had this instance where you tell someone, oh, hi, my name is Christina or hi, my name is Steven. Um, and they ask, well, she wouldn't what's say your hi, real my name? name? Is Steven. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Technicals. Like, yeah, what's your real name? As if your real name isn't Christina. Or... Um, no, but like, um, Sometimes they would ask, um, like for my Chinese name, be fascinated by that. Oh, and then it's like, yeah. And like um, regarding like the situation that you guys talked about, um, a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago, my brother like um, experienced something like that. He was like on the streets, just like um, going to school. And like, there was like a um, old person um, and he was just like calling him a Japanese person. and. Um, my brother, he like texted me, he was like laughing it off, but like, I think um, at this point, Asians are using like, um, are, are like trying to laugh it off, but like deep inside, I definitely do think um, it's like hurting them because like they're more than just the race, they are so much more like, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And going back to what you were saying earlier, the fascination with like like native names, Chinese names, your original names is so strange. Like yeah. my friend, um, my friend Emily, she's Korean. And so she has a Korean name. Um, and 
um she was talking to somebody and she pronounced it and their immediate reaction wasn't like oh that's interesting that's cool that's nice they said this is just like in squid games <laughs> i mean i i know i was like i was gonna ask christina how you felt about like an asian making fun of asian culture because like i know as in like because a lot of people usually like people say like oh i'm asian i can make fun of myself and be mm -hmm. like ah oh, I'm the only Chinese kid in my math class that's not in calculus because, you know, I'm not that good at math. But, like, how do you feel, like, Asians making fun of their own culture is, like, how would you feel? Is it, like, okay for them to do it because they're Asian? Or is it something that we should, like, just put a stop to in general? Um, I think it's, um, it's more we should put a stop to it um, because I feel like Asians should be proud of where they came from and like celebrate that rather than like just like making jokes or like showing like um, like furthering the stereotypes of Asians and yeah. Definitely. And I think that overall those like generalizations about Asian people like oh like Asian people eat dogs or stuff like that like all of those really harmful stereotypes just further push this narrative and like push the divide right it yeah. it tends to increase like xenophobia too because they're they're the differences between Asian people and like white people are greatly exaggerated and I think that if it was more of like a nuanced educational take that wouldn't be happening yeah I know uh oh yeah um, this couldn't relate back to Stephen but I know at our school we do celebrate like a couple Asian holidays like on Chinese New Year they br they brought in lions one year like dancing lions they gave out like red envelopes but I they didn't give like any preparation for what was happening like kids were just thrown into this like cafeteria and bam lions came out um so obviously many kids probably felt overwhelmed and very confused and like Obviously, it's, I think it's better if you, like, educate people on culture. I'm just going to throw it to Stephen to finish the story. Please. Yeah, it was just, I know a couple of people that I overheard, um, they were making fun of the situation, like, the lions making the stereotypical Asian jokes. Um, and that definitely wasn't helpful. I don't think the school intended this, but it would have been nice in the announcement. Um, we have a written announcement every day. If they introduced the events, what it is maybe a little bit of history yeah because like the, the kids just like it felt very ignorant to just like throw them this holiday and then expect mm -hmm. kids to be open-minded and expect them to understand what was happening I know I was sitting at a table with like a couple friends and they were they, they just kind of looked like oh my god that lion is coming at me I am scared um so obviously we want like positive reception to our culture yeah. but like the way our school dealt with it was probably not the best way um, how do you feel like like celebrating Asian culture in like a, like the most efficient and calm manner? Um, so at our school, um, so in our school, uh, let's explain. Uh, so in our school district, um, this is like the second year they're doing like um, days off for Asians or half uh, for like Asian like celebrations or half days but I feel like um, they don't go in dive deep into what why it is a like a half day or why the no school why what's the um, celebration for and then um, but there is like a positive in my school where we have like um, a um international day where we are able to celebrate the dancing um like of different clubs like um asa which is like asian students of america i mean sorry american students of american uh, asians origins so like they like do fan dance or like um like just like regular pop like modern pop for asians and then there's also like um korean students association where they learn about like uh koreans um dancing and yeah oh wow well, that's really cool i know we celebrated indian culture at our school it was actually pretty fun yeah. they like they took the entire day lunch was served was like indian food they did like it was for diwali yes. they had dancers outside teaching students how to dance so that was really fun and great although Stephen and I do go to an Episcopal school, so we do put a lot of emphasis on Christianity and Christmas. 
we do celebrate like other holidays obviously but like it's, it's like very shoved in our face because every seven days we have to go to chapel and we have to you know listen to prayers wait <laughs> the events for like holidays like diwali and stuff like that were those um done by the school or done by like clubs parents Parents. yeah parent volunteers yeah I feel like that's tough because a lot of the a lot of these celebrations while they're very like they're very in-depth and they're very educational and they're very good a lot of the best ones usually come from either parents or like individual clubs at the school like you were mentioning and I think that we need to find a way to incorporate that into like the regular curriculum so that we can normalize because the incorporation of that would um would normalize celebrating cultures that don't like directly that don't conform to the like I guess like not really American but like the stereotypical archetype of like um celebrating Christmas celebrating Thanksgiving all of that because some people like celebrate different holidays and the um the Chinese New Year celebration with the like the big spectacle was that done by your school Uh, nope parents Parents. (laughs) oh okay I was gonna say because if that was (sighs) I kind of wish it was done by the school because then I would have a better argument here. But, <laughs> um, but a lot of the spectacles that are done by schools, a, a lot of schools don't have like the time nor the resources to fully understand or do like a full educational seminar on the holiday that they're celebrating. So it ends up being more harmful than beneficial. And I feel like there needs to be a way besides like classes and stuff like that, because certain people can choose to take certain classes to make that a part of like standard curriculum. Mm-hmm. And we actually did have an international potluck. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was organized by the school, mm-hmm. um, but it was the parents that brought in the food from different cultures mm-hmm. and organized. I think we had Chinese or these two students that learn um, a form of Chinese dance. I forgot what it was called, but they came in and danced for us. Yeah, I think I know which dancers. I, I don't know if Steven knows about the whole debacle that went down at our school yeah. because um we we use chapel as a way to talk about like current events um and like you know we had like a lot of talks about you know a different kinds of hate and we had like a lot of chapels on like black lives matters which is like really great it's really important but we had no chapels on asian hate it was so confusing so one of the students who happens to be asian wanted like an asian hate chapel they wanted like the situation to be represented our chaplain was very stubborn and said there was no spaces left to make space for the asian hate chapel and it was through threatening from a higher authority from a um that we got the Asian hate chapel Mm -hmm. and I actually felt really upset because it was only for upper schoolers and at the time I was an eighth grader Mm -hmm. and I could not watch the chapel Mm because like I wanted to see how the situation was represented and um I think Steven saw the chapel because he's a grade above me um but I got really bad feedback when I asked about the chapel it was very shallow very Um, shallow like performative right uh it's almost like they did it just to do it, not to actually discuss um, what went down and reflect. It was just kind of shallow, like students, some students talk about their experience mm-hmm. and they, it's almost like they skirted around the issue, like yeah. they went around the issue a little bit. It's it's tough having, because I feel like with stuff like that, you need to have a combination of like anecdotal stuff so that you can see, like, so that you kind of bring, it's like an appeal to pathos, right? You associate the hate that's going on with like a person and that makes you kind of, it makes you feel empathy. Yeah, for the people that are going through the situation. But it's tough when you bring in a bunch of anecdotal, like a bunch of anecdotes and a bunch of people talking about their own experiences, because obviously that's not representative of what everybody has experienced especially with racism like that's a different experience for everyone no 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 i was done (laughs) Um, and this is a segue into one of our questions oh yeah um yeah so this (laughs) um this chapel happened during covid when asian hate crime was on an increase um partially because of covid but do you think there are any other major reasons why Asian crime was at an incre- is at an increase even now? Um, I feel like Asian hate crimes has always been a big thing in society, but it's always been like played on a down low. There's been just like um, written responses of what happened, like at like places, but like there's also like um, I don't know why, but like 
many like people target like Asian like um elderlies and it's like um really harmful just like scary to even know that that might be your grandma or your grandpa and it's like really dangerous and like I think that it's just that there's it's like because of the model minority myth or like that the Asian Asian community is privileged and like they think that we don't work hard and it's just yeah um, back to movies because I am not a movie fanatic, but I recently did watch Shang Chi, which oh. is like, which is big on like spreading like Asian appreciation, specifically mm -hmm. I believe Chinese. Um, mm -hmm. I watched the movies. I think it was pretty fun. And they did a lot of like background mythology lore. Um, the one thing I do have to mention though, are the captions. The captions like really just like sent me off to like a different boat, and I'm like, I'm done, no more. Um, because the captions, like, I think the way they portrayed, like, the Chinese language was a little bit iffy. It was, like, back and forth. Suddenly, like, white writers had the script, and it was translated into Chinese, and then the Chinese people had the script, and then it was translated to English, and it was just, like, please pick one, because at some times, like, captions were, like, high grade, and it was, like, yes, the Chinese is really good. The captions make sense, like, correct translations. And then all of a sudden, the Chinese gets downloaded into, like, just English direct translations. And then the captions suddenly are, like, just basically English. Like, they took the captions and translated into Chinese. And it's, like, yes, this is now the language we were speaking. And I was just kind of miffed because, like, with, like, English readers reading the translations, it gave, like, a different vibe than, like, mm -hmm. what the actual Chinese was giving. Like, it wasn't authentic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, also, like, um, Marvel Studio, like, um, compared to many other films, Shang-Chi wasn't really, like, publicized as much as the other films, yeah, and sure. it's, like, yeah, it was, like, definitely crazy to see that, mm -hmm. and um, also, like you said, um, I definitely think that, um, that the, like, subtitles um it's just like for some people like the true meaning of the chinese words are like definitely not like um translated correctly and it's just like changed the whole perspective of like what asian like chinese culture are like this perception of Asian culture is really, really problematic because a lot of times Chinese culture specifically, I think maybe it's because of like the um, like the way that the writing is done in like such a pretty like with calligraphy and stuff like that. I think that it reduces Asian culture to something that's like an aesthetic. And I've actually seen this a lot. Um, I think in 2020, actually, I saw this a lot where people would wear like traditional Asian gowns or something like that as an aesthetic. And even um, like well-known retailing websites like Sheen and stuff like that we're selling cropped asian gowns or like graphics that are pretty sacred in asian culture and commodifying it making it an aesthetic and then even like the asian characters people like there's there's this phenomenon of like badly translated t-shirts where they have the characters on a t-shirt or something like that because they look really pretty and it just it translates to something that is like the that isn't true to the word's actual meaning and then even things like the way that Asian people look, um, it's really difficult because for like years, for, for forever, basically, Asian people have been criticized for the way that they look. All races experience this. And like starting, when did this start? 19. 2019? Maybe. Okay, yeah. This phenomenon started like a couple of years ago where people would, um, something called Asian fish, where they would like extend eye makeup or get yeah. surgery to make their eyes look different. And I think that that's really tough because it reduces Asian culture to something that's like an aesthetic, something that's so frivolous. And hypocritical. Definitely. Yeah. I, I knew like, personally, I was not bullied for having a fox eye because I have double eyelids. I don't know how monolids. I know Michi has monolids, mm -hmm. but um, I know like a lot of my friends who are pretty insecure about their monolids, and then all of a sudden the migraine pose became a thing, and they're like, "God damn it!" Yeah, <laughs> you're like, "Why? Why was I made fun of as a kid, and now it's like a whole new trend?" It's like this whole thing with like white validation, right? Because the second that like American people or white people validate um like culture, Chinese culture, not even Chinese culture, sorry, Asian culture as something that's important to them, then it becomes important to everybody. Like even stuff like 
um one of the most recent examples i can think of is squid games that yeah that blew up in popularity right Be- and it's a k-drama but so many there's been so many other like groundbreaking k-dramas from before squid game and is it squid game or squid games squid game squid game there's okay one game. It's just one game. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, but there's been so many other groundbreaking K-dramas that happened before Squid Game, singular. And it's just people People thought, a lot of white people, I guess, thought, that sounded kind of mean. Okay. <laughs> white people specifically thought that Squid Game was like the first K-drama of its time, which is so untrue. And then so many other things like eye, eye shape, um, like Asian clothing is something that isn't valued until white people view it as something that they appreciate. Yeah, this new like, okay, we're now going to talk about Korea because Michi is half Korean, but um, <laughs> Korea cult- Korean culture is just like suddenly like just like been slapped in Americans' faces. I want that's like the wrong verb, but I'm just like, all, it's just, I'm trying to impress my English teacher here with uh, using robust verbs okay but um basically um i feel like korean culture has just been like waves are been like shoved into american faces and it's like yes k-dramas exist no they exist now and then like k-pop was imported i think in like 2017 and like i think like now people know that there are like so like now there's like been like the big three like asian countries that Mm -hmm. have like like their cultures imported and it leaves like this impression that there are only three Asian countries. How do you yeah. feel like is there a way to combat this? Um, um I definitely do think that we need more representation in like just media or like just like movies, but um it's hard to like combat it, I think, but like we can always like start in school just showing like I guess like just like ethnic um, shows or, or like just like stories from the uh, originated um, uh, countries and yeah. No, that's really like, that's really such a good point. Um, sorry, okay. That's really such a good point because I feel like exposure at such a young age is really, really, really important because if you don't like, if you don't kind of guide, especially younger kids um, in their educational career on like what Asian culture is important and like different parts of Asian culture, then you lead them to figure it out on their own, especially when they're older. And mainstream media makes it really, really easy to fall down kind of like the K-pop anime rabbit hole where that's all you, like that's that's what Asian culture is reduced to because those are the most popular parts of Asian culture. So you like perpetuate this thing where um, Asian culture is reduced to like whatever is popular. And then whoever tries to learn more about it, they automatically default to what is popular and it just makes whatever is like what Asian culture has been reduced to now more and more prevalent. Yeah, I know Japan is just been like reduced to the like the specific like high fashion Lolita or like mm-hmm. anime, and then you have like or like the video games they produce, and then like I know Korean culture is just K-pop, K-drama, and then Chinese culture is a little bit more confusing because China in general in America has like really bad prep like rep or like press so it's it's just like questionable it's either you're talking about communism or you're talking about like tiktok i think also there's this pressure on mainstream media or at least there should be this pressure um for them to represent the culture correctly um bringing us back to squid game uh unfortunately uh, it all comes back to squid game yeah. <laughs> We have a publication in our school called The Tower where students can impress their, express their opinion on certain things. And someone mentioned that the song in Squid Game for the um, red light, green light, it's something that's super personal to them because um, they hear it all the time when they're little. But the original meaning of the thought song is not um, red light, green light. It's actually something else. So and uh, when everyone, when a lot of people sing this song in their mind they think okay red light green light yeah. but it's it's something really different it's yeah red light green light because that's how internationally we see it like that's mm-hmm. the game but yeah like in korea the saying is different and then like sacred things get used in mainstream media and then reduced to something that's like usually a niche reference to that piece of media that used it which is really difficult right, like the lion Yeah. So like overall, do you think that um, the incorporation of Asian culture into media is beneficial or harmful? 
Um, I feel like the way, like you guys said, um, the way they incorporate it is definitely harmful in ways. Like, um, it hurts the people who are who actually like learn, um, know these stuff from when they were little. Um, but I feel like if it is incorporated in a um good way, like actually learning about what it actually means lion or like um the red light green light um song i think it would definitely be beneficial to society yeah and then this is just going back to like social media um this is just personally this like just popped into my mind after thinking a little bit too hard but um basically um i know that like a lot of asian people like korean beauty standards japanese beauty standards chinese like in general just beauty standards in east asia is like 10 times more different than like it's just a little bit different than american beauty standards not 10 times i don't know what i'm saying but um um, i know that like a lot of like a lot of asian people get bad rep for like doing a lot of like crazy crazy beauty things i know like americans call americans are not okay i need to stop generalizing but basically um um some people do like plastic surgery but like in media all across media you can see like people like taping their faces back like i don't know i saw people pulling something out of their nose i don't know how to explain <laughs> this okay like they were just, what like, is coming out of their nose joyce <laughs> i think it's like tissue paper why is it there in the first place i don't know i know like a lot of times people give bad rep for like so much makeup like having like really pale skin I know is like something that's pretty prevalent amongst East Asian countries I know not just like Korea China I know like other countries definitely have it too yeah and do you how do you think like this like this these differences in like beauty standards might affect the way people see these two cultures side by side um, so I feel like beauty standards in general is definitely um negative. It just like puts um, women or slash men down um to like just making it look like, oh, if you're not this, I don't want to date you or like if you're not like pretty or whatever. But I feel like um like there are like but I feel like it's like really hard. It's just like putting it side by side. It um, shows the true difference in culture. Like in Asian cultures, like um, pale skin is like praised and like, um, or in American culture, or uh, sorry, or um, some people who um, believe that like being tan or dark skin, um, like just like tanning yourself is like um, praised also. But I feel like it's like beauty standards should like overall be like destroyed and like people should like be whoever they want and this difference in beauty standards is like really bad i feel like it's especially um damning to people who grew up in like an asian country where the beauty standards are completely different and then immigrated to america or spend most of their time like in america because i would feel like like i can't understand this personally but if I were, if the beauty standards were drastically different in two places that I feel I'm a part of, I would be very, like, I would have a very negative view of myself because my beauty, like beauty standards from my home country or something like that wouldn't match the place that I am right now. And I also feel like the difference in beauty standards often leads to like a lot of harmful things, like the fetishization of Asian people as like exotic or different, which is just really harmful overall. I feel like a lot of these differences ultimately like all come back to hate right because a lot of times you view anybody who's different than you as somebody who is unacceptable and that's this can be on like a smaller scale right with with small scale things like your taste in certain things and then this can even be on a larger scale with race ultimately it comes down to this idea where people think that anybody who's different than them is inferior or bad and I think that this contributes to hate a lot so is there any way that that either parents or children can work to correct their existing biases? Um, I do believe so. I feel like, um, like in my family, it's like um, different views also, but like I usually do listen, like um, be open-minded about their like um, situation and like what they t- talk to me about. And also when I talk to them, like with different views also, they make sure to listen, make sure like they're, learning but also like um trying to understand their point of view and um also in that moment understanding mine so i think 
interactions with different generations, um, it can like um, bring a whole circle, understand different point of views and also learning from each other. Thank you. I also want to extend this question. Sorry. I also want to extend this question this question further to the education system because um usually when you make fun when you make fun of someone or when you want to try to put someone down because they're different because they're different um you make fun of their culture you take from the negative of it instead of looking at the positive parts and at school for asian history of course it's important to learn about all aspects but it's very heavily concentrated on say things like um yeah. like how things didn't work but then of course there are positives but like the inventions but um how do you think the schools can be modified to promote like asian like the positives of Asian culture? Like, really, the only thing I learned that was, like, really positive about, like, Asian culture was learning about the Silk Road, or, like, the Silk Road and, like, learning about the benefits of it. And I feel like um, it doesn't show actually what Asia, like, Asian co countries and culture is. And I feel like we need to, like, like understand how it's implemented in our um, history, like, um, the inventions of some type of like things that like people don't know that it's been like created or like manufactured by Asians or like just like public speakers or motivational speakers that um, helped um, bring Asian society into history. Yeah, and I feel like the combination of history, which almost always is like brutal, bloody, terrible, like yeah. European history, American history, all of it is ultimately like pretty, like there's more bad than good. And the combination of teaching history and culture is kind of problematic because history is usually not really a good thing you have to learn about the negative parts but culture is something that is good and the separation of that classes there's not much room for that especially in public high schools so and there's a lot more room for it in areas of higher education like college so with college what do you plan on like doing in college so that you can further learn about like culture and stuff like that and try to correct any existing biases or like stop Asian hate like is there anything specifically that you're working on um i'm specifically um so i'm i've been thinking about either being coming a pediatrician or like just um learning about um society in general mm -hmm. and like by that by doing that i was like learning maybe like majoring in like um sociology or like uh, asian studies really just like learning about my own culture like despite like me going back to china a lot and like going on to those like um Chinese field trips where you go to China and like learn about culture it's, I feel like it's definitely not an immense like um knowledge of what yeah. um China is and yeah um how would you feel if you were like overwhelmed with like negative outlook of society um I feel like um I would like challenge that and like and during like um college seminars or like just classes I would um say why are we like only looking at the bad parts of um so like just culture or like society why aren't we like praising the um good and yeah yeah, overall, I think the dialogue on like Asian hate is, first of all, like subjects like racism and stuff like that are obviously right now very taboo. So it's difficult to um, approach this dialogue, especially with like a mixed group of people without walking on eggshells. So what do you think is the best way to have dialogue about Asian hate? Um, I feel like, um, it's just like, I feel like, um, a heart to heart conversation where people are able to be transparent with each other would definitely be great. And like, just like learning about, the, um, their stories, like how they like, um, like how, what was their um, stories regarding Asian hate or like in general hate, hate crimes and like it's just like um being transparent allowing people to like be themselves and like just letting them like speak their heart out it was would be definitely helpful for sure and um it's going to be difficult to implement this in, in settings like educational ones obviously so do you like what do you think is the best way to have these kinds of discussions like through outside of school organizations through clubs 
Um, I think through clubs, also, um, I guess, organizations um, like a student forum or just like um, a forum for where people are able to talk about um, the situations um, in my school. Um, there's a APIU, Asian Pacific Islander Union, um, where in that um, place, they're also talking, learning about like Asian history, but also like just when they're uh, just like when like just the rise of hate crimes, they, they um, take the time to like, just be transparent. They just like talk to each other about what happened and yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you have anything to add? Well, um, I was gonna ask, um, do you think there should also be a, a platform where um, people can ask questions, um, no matter if it may seem offensive because of um, what they're exposed to? like misinformation that they're exposed to do you think something like that could help or anything like that Thanks. um i do think a platform will definitely help like answering questions um but like if it's like offensive i feel like we're able to like just like change that um point of view or like help them like um, educate them like um how they should look at it rather than like look at it in a different perspective but yeah yeah I feel like just in general like this transparency and all of the multiple perspectives and looks into racism against Asians Asian culture all of that is so critical to correcting existing biases and stuff which is why it was really really important to us to have you on here to talk about it um and I think overall we covered everything we need to right yep okay Perfect. Yeah, we really, really love and admire you. And we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day, which I'm sure is very busy to be here with us. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of thank course. You. Good yeah. luck Good on, on uh, your finals. Yep. Mm -hmm. thank, yeah. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But yeah, thank Bye. you so much for coming. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.